Good morning, congregation. Welcome to this morning's worship service. Pray that we may all be blessed by the preaching of God's word and that our hearts may be lifted up as we worship the Lord together and sing praises to his most holy name. Uh, just a few announcements this morning. Um, first of all, in the bulletin for next week, it's announced that um, in the AM is preparatory, or in the AM is installate, sorry. Next week, Sunday in the morning, will be preparatory service at 9.30. And in the afternoon at 3.30 will be the installation of the office bearers. Also, I'd like to announce the uh, wedding bands of Carissa Ruth Beakey and Nathan Derek Camphouse. They have indicated their intention to be married before the face of God. They desire to begin this holy state in the name of the Lord and to complete it to his glory. The Lord willing, and apart from any legal objections, the ceremony will take place on September 18. And this is the first announcement. Our call to worship um, also, Wednesday night's Bible study, uh, hopes to resume on September 15 at 7.30. And those who are interested can contact either L. Brower or George Park. So Wednesday night Bible study, September 15. The call to worship this morning comes to us from 1 Peter 1, verse 25. And there we read, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Let us respond by singing from Psalter 40, verses 1, 2, and 4. Psalter 40, verses 1, 2, and 4. Congregation, the Lord has called us and brought us together to worship Him, and we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth, and in Christ Jesus is an overflowing fountain of good. Amen. Receive the greeting of the Lord, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us worship the Lord today with singing from Psalter number 251, 251 from Psalm 92, the Sabbath day psalm as it is often known by way of its title. It is good to sing thy praises and to thank thee, O Most High. We'll sing all three stanzas.
God makes our lives victorious through the gospel, through His Son, Jesus Christ. And when we worship the Lord on the Lord's day, then we listen to His law to be driven in part to Jesus Christ and also to be shown how to live the victorious life, the life of new obedience in praise and thanks to the Lord. So we read the law this morning from Exodus 20, and the summary from Matthew 22, and then let us sing together from Psalter number 64, Lord, I lift my soul to Thee, all the stanzas of 64. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. This is what God has said. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. <clears throat> Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Teacher, one said to Jesus, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets.
Well, it's good to be back with you again, congregation, and to see, to see you this morning and also to see some of you whom I haven't seen for a long time due to some of the pandemic matters. And it's a privilege to be able to worship God and to hear His Word. And this morning, I want to turn with you to the Old Testament prophecy of Nahum, the Old Testament prophet Nahum. Nahum's um, a very short book. In our Pew Bibles, you can find it on page 823, 823. And I want to read with you chapter 1, Nahum chapter 1. And let us hear the Word of God this morning, the burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Alkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on His adversaries, and He reserves wrath for His enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has His way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of His feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry, and dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before Him, the hills melt, and the earth heaves at His presence, yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Who can stand before His indignation? And who can endure the fierceness of His anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by Him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who trust in Him. But with an overflowing flood, He will make an utter end of its place, and darkness will pursue His enemies. What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. For while tangled like thorns, and while drunken like drunkards, they shall be devoured like stubble, fully dried. From you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus says the Lord, though they are safe, and likewise many, yet in this manner they will be cut down when he passes through. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. For now I will break off his yoke from you and burst your bonds apart. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave, for you are vile. Behold, on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feasts, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Our text is from verse 7. Nahum 1, verse 7, the well-known words, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who trust in Him. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. Amen. Let us come before the Lord in prayer and seek for His blessing as we worship Him together as a congregation. Truly, O Lord, it is good to sing your praises, to proclaim your loving kindness, and to rejoice in your faithfulness. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because your compassions do not fail. They are new, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And Lord, may we say then that you are our portion, and we will hope in you. We give thanks that you have brought us together this morning as a congregation to worship you. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And we pray, Lord God, that you will meet us here, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, true and living God. Without you, we perish. In you alone, we live. And we pray, therefore, that you will hear us and help us 
and bless us. We don't deserve it, Lord, left to ourselves. We confess that to you. You are a holy God, and we are an unholy people. We pray that our sins of youth you may not remember nor record our trespasses. All the sins, Lord, of our life of which we are guilty, sin in Adam and sin every day, even when we know better, even when we desire to do differently. So often, like Paul, we too can experience that the good that we will to do, we do not do. And the evil we will not to do, that we practice. Oh Lord God, we pray, have mercy on us. Help that we may confess our sin and forsake our sin. And grant that we might find mercy through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. We give thanks to you for him, for sending him and for all of his saving work. We praise you, O oh Lord, for the way he was faithful and obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. For in his bearing also the cross, he bore the curse that is upon us in Adam. And through his suffering and through his finishing the work that you gave him to do, we might be pardoned, we might receive forgiveness, we might be cleansed, restored and made new, and that forever and ever. Oh Lord God, we pray that you would today turn our eyes to your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that we may see him in his beauty and glory, also as he is proclaimed in the gospel. We pray that as he is lifted up among us, our hearts may be drawn to him and that we may be, de may be delighting in him individually and as families and as a congregation. Will you receive our worship, O oh Lord, and will you be praised and exalted among us and by us in this morning? We pray for one another. Will you help all those, O oh Lord, in special need? Remember all those who are under doctor's care. We can have so many weaknesses and frailties that we experience, whether young or old. We pray, Lord, that you will hear the needy when they cry. We especially commend to you Hannah and Dan as Hannah anticipates a scan next week. We pray, Lord, that you will bless the scan and if it can be your will, also grant favorable results that Hannah might hear good news and that she might rejoice also in your provision for her. Whatever the outcome, O oh Lord, give her quiet trust and patience and be with her and Dan together as they walk this difficult way. We pray for their whole family, all their loved ones, and all of us as a congregation as we wait and pray for them and with them. We commend to you as well Anita Brower in all of her frailty and ask that you may be with her, Lord, as she struggles along as well. We pray that she may have yet many good days and blessed days. And we know that you are able also to heal her richly and abundantly. We commend her to you and her loved ones and pray that you will be very near to her. We pray, Lord, for others among us, also older ones, also those who are homebound. And we commend them all to you, Lord, the great shepherd of the sheep, the great Father of all your children. We pray, Lord, that you would supply for all our needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. May it be that in weakness and affliction we learn to live close to you and that we experience what your word declares, that affliction for your people is for our profit. We pray, Lord, that you would so bless all these things that we undergo in life, also in family life. Bless every husband, every wife, every father, every mother. Remember those, Lord, who experience family trouble, family strife. We pray, Lord, for families where there is division, where there is tension. We pray that we may learn to meet together before the Lord Jesus and that we may experience through Him uniting power and restoring grace. We pray, too, Lord, for those who are without family, for those who are unmarried, for those who have lost their spouse. We pray for all who are mourning. We pray that you will comfort and strengthen everyone. We thank you too when we experience blessings and we think of Carol and Fred Krudbosch with Carol's birthday tomorrow and how you have blessed her with health and strength and brought her 
to a high age and to the age of the strong. And will you grant her, Lord, a blessed day and also together with her family to rejoice in your goodness and to look to you to supply for every day and for every need. We pray, Lord, too, for those who may be listening in over the phone or through the internet, those who may be away on vacation. We thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity to meet together in this way, in spirit. And we pray that you will bless us richly through your spirit. We pray, too, Lord, that you may remember your church and your people all throughout this world. We commend to you our churches as they meet this week in Synod. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing on the Synod meetings in Branford, the prayer service on Tuesday night and the meetings on Wednesday and Thursday. That you will grant traveling mercies to all the delegates and also unity of mind and heart and focus and purpose and spirit in the work to which you have called us. We thank you that we may be in a federation of like-minded churches. And we pray, Lord, that we may grow, that we may be revived and increased more and more and a witness also in a dark and broken world. We do remember, Lord, before you our land and also our leaders. And we pray, Lord, for your mercy to our Prime Minister. And also we pray for wisdom in government, also for our Premier. And Lord, for the tasks that are before them, that they may look to you for wisdom and guidance. We think too, Lord, how we are in the midst of an election federally. And we pray also in that regard that you may have mercy on us and grant us leadership that is principled and righteous and We don't deserve that, Lord, as a people we know, but we bring our need to you and we pray for your your mercy. And we pray also for grace to submit to whatever may be the outcome. And we pray, Lord, that you will to that end bless the preaching of the word everywhere. Bless it wherever it is brought today. Strengthen all of your servants and also among us as we hear the gospel throughout the day. May we listen attentively and May we experience the anointing of the Spirit. May may we wait upon you, Lord God, and will you renew our strength so that we may mount up with wings like eagles, so that we may run and not be weary, and so that we may walk and not faint. Oh, will you hear us, Lord, and will you bless us for your name's sake, for Jesus' sake. In his name we come to you. Amen. We commend to you the needs of the church and of the work of Elisha House and the ministry that it provides in our region. And may the Lord bless you. We don't give in the service, but we do commend to you the offerings and the opportunity to give at other times. Let us continue in this service to worship with singing from a selection of Psalm 37, Psalter number 96. Psalter number 96, rest in the Lord and be thou still, with patience wait his holy will, enduring to the end. Fret not, though sinners' gains increase, forsake thy wrath from anger cease, it will to evil tend, and so on. The four stanzas of number 96.
Well, I invite you to have your Bibles open to Nahum again, Nahum 1 and verse 7. And beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our text speaks about a stronghold, as you can see. The Lord as a stronghold. But what in the world is a stronghold? What is a stronghold? Well, maybe, children, you can think of a castle or a fort. Perhaps some of you have been to Casa Loma, I think in Toronto. It's some sort of castle, if I understand. Or maybe you have gone to Fort George here in Niagara. Or perhaps you have visited some other castle or some other fort. Basically, castles and forts are strongholds. In other words, they are places of safety. They are places where you can be secure with their high walls and their tall towers and their strong defenses and more. When you enter into a stronghold, then you can experience a measure of protection. If you're in danger, if people are after you, and you know there is a fort nearby or a castle nearby, you can make your way as fast as possible and hopefully inside escape whatever the threat may be. Back in Samuel, for instance, we can read about David at different times going down into the stronghold. And in his case, the stronghold was many times the mountains in the wilderness, the the rocks and the caves where he could escape detection by Saul and where he could experience a measure of safety. Today, our homes are in many ways a kind of stronghold where we experience safety, where we can lock our doors at night and not have to worry about anyone entering in. Stronghold. We all know, we all have some idea about a stronghold. But now our text says something powerful. Our text says the Lord is a stronghold. The Lord is good, says Nahum, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who trust in Him. So the Lord is a stronghold. And that means then that we can be safe and secure for sure in the Lord and with the Lord. Now, this is nothing new to us. I mean, the Bible speaks like this so often, doesn't it? Especially in the Psalms. Maybe we think of Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He will hide me in His pavilion. Or Psalm 46. We'll sing that at the very end this morning. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Or Psalm 91, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's all over the Psalms and it's throughout the Bible. It's a common, it's a precious theme in Scripture. And now here we find it in the prophecy of Nahum. Nahum is proclaiming to us the Lord as a stronghold where we are safe for sure in Him, all who belong to Him, all who are trusting in Him. The Lord is our stronghold. And what a stronghold! What care and keeping He provides, because Nahum adds that last little piece when he says, He knows those who trust in Him. He knows. And that word know is a very rich word. It means more than that He is aware or that He keeps record It's richer than that. It it means basically that He cares for you. Yes, He even loves those who trust in Him. He loves. What a stronghold. How different from any other stronghold ever. You might go to a castle. You might go to Fort George and maybe arrange to spend the night there even and enjoy it. But no castle, no fort, no mere earthly stronghold can provide for you the way the Lord will know you, care for you, love you, even as He protects you. Oh, what a stronghold. What a picture of God is presented here to us in God's Word. And let's listen, therefore, to this special text. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who trust in Him. I came to this text in view of the times in which we live. All the challenges, all the trouble that is all around us, all the time, And this word speaks to our day. 
This word speaks to our whole life. Safe for sure in the Lord. That's the theme. Safe for sure in the Lord. And let's see, first of all, how much this matters. How much this matters. And it matters because trouble, as I said, is all around us. It was so in the days of Nahum. He talks about the day of trouble. And the trouble in view then was particularly, or, or at least to some extent, on account of enemies. In Nahum's day, the Assyrians, centered in Nineveh, they were in charge of the world. And what a threat they were to the people of God, among others. Now, years before Nahum, children, you remember this too, Nineveh had heard the preaching of Jonah and had repented in sackcloth and ashes. And the judgment that was being threatened them had been stayed, and there had been a change. But that hadn't lasted. Now, about a hundred years later, when Nahum is on the scene, Nineveh, Nineveh is back to its old, ungodly, rebellious ways, and is as dangerous as ever. Already they had destroyed the ten tribes of Israel, and for years, they were a threat and a danger to the Jews in Judah and in Jerusalem. Think of the fearful time we can read about in the history, both in Kings and, and Chronicles and in Isaiah, all about how the Assyrians come right up to the gates of Jerusalem. Remember the days of King Hezekiah. And they threatened to crush the king and the people and the city. And it was so tense for all of them. Indeed, Hezekiah and his leadership thought for a while they were finished. But the Lord delivered them. But the point now is that Nineveh was so dangerous. They were enemies. They hated the Lord. They hated His church. And they made it their mission to wipe them off the face of the earth. And in view of that, God's people, fearful and trembling, needed a stronghold. God's people, no place to go, needed, needed somewhere to be safe and secure. More even than the walls of the city. More than the safety of their capital, they needed the Lord above all. So that was in Nahum's day. Well, fast forward to our day. Are we not also threatened by enemies? Isn't it true that the people of God today still know about dangers, toils, and snares, and those who are out to take us down? We think of that, don't we? we? We remain conscious of that, don't we? For example, the devil. The Bible says that he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he has an entire army of soldiers, servants, like-minded spirits, all demons, and in some way and to a great extent they are permitted to make war with the saints of God. And we need the Lord as our stronghold, therefore, every day and every hour. And then there is this present world and the spirit of this age. And sometimes it can all be so distracting and tempting. And that by itself is dangerous. And other times the spirit of the age is so deceitful and confusing and we need to be so discerning with all that we meet with in life. Vigilant and on guard and maintaining a difference in this world. And then there can be other times when the spirit of the world rises up in hostility and opposition and even persecution, while well, we're seeing that today in so many places. And again, we need the Lord as our stronghold. And then, of course, there is our own weakness. We always have to fight our own sinful hearts. Inside of us, there is a law of sin that seeks to lead us into captivity, and we, we live with a body of death that can make our life torturous at times. And again, we need then a stronghold. We need the Lord to be our stronghold, to be safe from Satan, from this world, and from our own self. And let us remember that. We live in days of trouble on account of enemies. Nothing is new under the sun in that respect. And like the people in Nahum's day, we need a stronghold. We need the Lord. If we don't go to Him as our stronghold, we're defenseless. We're vulnerable. But you know there's more in our text more danger, more trouble. There's more, that it, that, that, there's more that makes it matter so much that the Lord is a stronghold. There's more, and that more 
That more is the fact that Nahum is telling us about how the Lord is going after all his enemies. This whole prophecy of Nahum, all three chapters, is about one major theme. God going after Nineveh. God about to annihilate Assyria. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. And he is about to break forth and let that judgment, that vengeance, loose. And if we're listening carefully, we can't help but hear, hear that just in this chapter. In verse 2, for instance, the way Nahum begins, God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance upon his adversaries. And then Nahum proceeds to tell us about the, how this judgment is about to fall on Nineveh and what becomes clear, and, and not just in chapter 1, you read the whole prophecy, it will be terrible, and none will escape. And on the one hand, that's of course a great comfort for all true people of God. It is, because it means that all the enemies will be destroyed. Verse 15 explains that. Behold, on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaims peace. O Judah, keep your appointed feasts, perform your vows, for the wicked one shall no more pass through you. Why not? He is utterly cut off. So that's what the Lord is proclaiming through Nahum and promising. He will go after every enemy. He will destroy every foe. And there is no one who will be able to snatch any one of God's people out of God's hand. How famously Paul put that in Romans 8 when he said, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. The enemy, every enemy, is going down. But even as we think about that, another question comes to the fore. How can you be sure how can I be sure that I won't be among those enemies? How can we be certain that we are among the friends of God? Those who will not be destroyed by Him. You know what makes this question all the more urgent is what we should know about ourselves. And that is the fact that we are all sinners. No matter who we are. No matter where we find ourselves in life. No matter if we grow up as pagans or if we have been raised up in church, we are all sinners by nature. We are all wicked, meaning we are haters of God and of our neighbor. And we have been bent that way through the sin of Adam, and so now we are guilty and dirty. And we deserve, therefore, like everyone else, we deserve that God should take vengeance on us. And think then of the questions that Nahum raises in verse 6 concerning the Lord and concerning His coming in judgment. Who can stand before His indignation, Nahum says? And who can endure the fierceness of His anger? See, it's one thing to be in trouble because of enemies and to hear about God coming in judgment upon them. That's good. But when we think about how we are not any different, really, and we aren't. Isn't that when the day of trouble becomes all the worse, all the scarier? Because now I realize that I too have to appear before God. I have to answer to Him. I have to give an account of myself to Him every second of my life. Every thought, every word, every deed, every transgression, every failure, every omission. All of it will be in view. And how will you survive? How will I survive that moment? Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of his wrath? You know, maybe some of you need to think about this in view of the way you treat your family. Or maybe some of you in the way you're behaving with the internet. Or some of you perhaps getting high or getting drunk. Who can stand? Before his indignation, who can endure the fierceness of his anger? He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. 
The mountains quake before Him. The hills melt. The earth heaves at His presence. The world and all who dwell in it. His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by Him. Nahum says, He will dig our grave for we are vile. Do we know what it's like to be sinners in the hands of an angry God? Do we understand what trouble we are in left to ourselves? What a day of trouble. And for that reason then we need a stronghold. We need a place of safety. We need someone to protect us and provide for us. Someone to acknowledge us and care for us. Someone to shelter us. But who? Well, Nahum says, the Lord. The Lord. But how? How can the Lord save us from the Lord, from the wrath of the Lord? Well, that question takes us to our next point. The way this can be. So safe for sure in the Lord, how much this matters. But now, secondly, the way this can be. What is that, the way? What is the way that in the Lord we can be safe? Well, one answer is that the Lord is almighty. Verse 3 makes reference to that when it says, The Lord is great in power. You know, He is so powerful. He is so powerful. And then Nahum proceeds to illustrate that by describing the reaction of creation to the presence of God. I mean, seas and rivers dry up. Mountains quake. And the earth and the world and everyone in it trembles. When He comes, the Lord is so powerful. He is almighty. And just that point then makes Him able to be a stronghold. There is no one who can successfully challenge or overthrow the Lord. There is no one greater than He is. How important to remember that. We serve a God who is awesome in power. But that can't be enough. I mean, that can't be enough to explain how the Lord is a stronghold. What about the fact that none of us deserves to be safe in Him? What about the fact that we too ought to suffer under His vengeance and wrath for all our sin and for all our rebellion? Well, here is where our text is so rich and so clear because Nahum begins like this. The Lord is good, he says. First part of the text. The Lord is good. That means that there is no evil in the Lord. He's never unjust. He's never unfair. He's never unkind. He's never harsh or mean or stingy or hard. No, that's not Him. He's, he's good. And He's alone in that. Just like no one is almighty like He is, so no one is good like He is. Jesus will say, no one is good but God. God is the standard of all goodness. The perfection of all goodness is found in God. And where do we see that goodness most of all? Is it not when He, when he opens His heart and, and spills out that goodness in grace and mercy to sinners? Isn't it when He reveals to us a way of salvation through sacrifice? In the Old Testament, it was the sacrifice of animals, a long-established practice by the time of Nahum. The people of God were well acquainted with it. All these animals, every morning a lamb, every evening a lamb, and so on. And many more sacrifices besides, and the Day of Atonement every year. And they knew all about how this worked. Mercy through sacrifice. Salvation through the shedding of blood. But animals were never enough, of course. No, nor were they meant to be. Instead, they, they, they were teaching aids. They, they pointed forward they pointed to another sacrifice, namely to the sacrifice of the incarnate Son of God. Now, Nahum lived long before Jesus came, but Nahum knew he was coming. Not all the details, not with the clarity that we know today, but Nahum knew because he saw God at work, just in his prophecy and through his prophecy, destroying Nineveh. Why? So that the Jews might survive. Why? So that the promise might remain. So that someday the Savior might be born. And that's what happened, as we know. God was always about that plan. And so in the fullness of time, Jesus did arrive. And Nahum knew he would. And let us think now about Jesus when he came. And let us think about what he came to do. Let us think about how he came to suffer. And what did he suffer? 
well, was it not the vengeance of God above all? Oh, men had a hand in it. They beat him and they abused him and they nailed him to the tree, but it was so much more than that. God's righteous judgment was being poured out on his son. Meaning what all sinners deserve, you and me too. That is what Jesus came to experience and endure. His own Father sending Him into the storm, sending Him into the cauldron. Who can stand before His indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of His anger? And Jesus was made to for sinners. And what an experience for Jesus. Far worse than we can even imagine or tell. But perhaps you can think of it like this. Jesus came into the day of trouble. Jesus came to meet enemies. Jesus came to be judged and condemned. Jesus came to be overwhelmed by the flood of suffering, by the anger and fury and wrath of God. And when Jesus came into all of that, there was ultimately no stronghold for Him. There was no place He could go, nowhere He could run to be safe for sure. He was unable to find security and a refuge and shelter. No, He was forsaken in a way that we cannot fathom. But what the Bible tells us is that Jesus was altogether alone on the cross, enduring the waves of God's judgment for such as us. And God was doing it. God was doing it. God had planned it. God sent His Son. God was now punishing His Son. And from all, all eternity, the Son was always on board with that plan. They were in it together, we might say, with the Holy Spirit too. And all of it was ultimately the triune God revealing goodness. Because through the suffering of Jesus, God was in a mysterious and most wonderful way at work. God was at work so that we might never have to suffer like Jesus did. But instead, we might find God always to be a stronghold for us, one to save us from every enemy, one even to protect us from God Himself, from the judgment and wrath we deserve. And this then is how it can be that we are safe for sure in the Lord, this and this alone through what God was doing, through the gospel and through Jesus. It is through Jesus, see, that God is a stronghold for sinners like you and me. It is through Jesus that we can go to the Lord and find safety and security in the day of trouble, when the storm rages, when the judgment comes. Yes, we can think of every trouble we can imagine, but most of all the trouble due to sin, to our guilt in Adam and our guilt in life. That is trouble like no other. Sometimes that trouble can press home in our life. Sometimes we can experience very great conviction of sin. Maybe you know what that's about too. Where you understand something of who you are and what you are like. And it presses you down. And where can you go? Maybe it's something you did long ago. Maybe it's something you're into right now. Maybe it's simply the fact that your whole life, you know from the start till, till the present, it's just not been good. And there you are, naked and exposed before the eye of God. How can you survive and be safe and be saved? There's only one way. In the Lord. Only the Lord can protect you from the Lord. Only He can do it, but also surely He can do it. See, that's Nahum's point. The Lord is good. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble. Every trouble, ultimate trouble. And yes, not only trouble due to conviction of sin, but also all the trouble we face in life. Because God gave Jesus to take care of our greatest trouble. We can know, we can be sure that we can find shelter from every trouble. And here, of course, we can't help but think of the troubles of today. The troubles that we all know and feel. All the pressure, all the strain, 
How easily it can happen that we are afraid or frustrated or perplexed or overwhelmed. And what can we do? Where can we go? Who will take us in? Is there any safe place? Yes, there is one. And it's for sure. The Lord. The Lord who is good. The Lord for the sake of Jesus. He is the way to be safe no matter what may come. No matter what we may have to endure, He is the one who will hold us close and care for us and love us and bring us safely through. Jesus is the way. And saying that, we go yet to our last point this morning. Safe for sure in the Lord. What we all must do. How much this matters, the way this can be, and what we all must do. Because what does Nahum say? Trust. Trust. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who trust in Him. See, Nahum is telling us the way to access the Lord as our stronghold. The way to be safe and secure in Him for sure and forever is simply and continually to trust. What does that mean? It means to turn to Him. It means to believe in Him. It means to submit to Him. If you think of the image of a castle, children, again, castle or a fort, it's like you run as fast as you can to that castle and to that fort. And God is like that. And when you get there, when you get to Him, you find it's open. It's not so that it's barred and gated and shut up. No, He's open. He receives all who come to Him. And when you come to Him, you say to Him, Lord Jesus, here I am in in your name and for your sake, will you take me in? And will you keep me close? And will you hold me fast? And will you never let me go? And will you guard me and protect me and love me? That's what faith says. That's what trusting means. It's all about seeking refuge in God, in Jesus Christ. Going to Him. Going into Him as the stronghold. And that is what we all must do. And let us do it in the day of trouble. This day of trouble. Let us do it in view of our sin and guilt. Let us do it as lost sinners. What you are and what I am. Make sure you see that and know that. And never forget that. What trouble we are in as sinners. And there is no other safe place and there is no other stronghold. Only one, only God in Christ. The Lord is good, a stronghold. Run to Him. Run to Him. That's foundational. I mean to seek the Lord to be saved from sin. But then also every other trouble. As we make our way through life, as we face enemies and opposition, as we meet trials and sickness and frailty and tension and affliction and loss and grief and hardship. We live in a broken world. We live in a weary world. I listened to someone this week who said, I am so tired. Especially with all that is happening today. I am so tired, this person said. And many of you, I suspect, understand that. Really, every Christian comes to that point sooner or later. This world is a weary world. We know about trouble. But we have a stronghold in the day of trouble. And every time we're to go to the Lord, every time we're to run to Him and trust in Him and to be sure that He knows those who trust in Him. See, that's how to live, congregation. There's no other way. But it's a good way. It's a secure way. To trust in Him, we are safe for sure in Him. Are you trusting Him this morning? I know many of us are. We've learned this. Well, we've been taught this. We've been brought to this point. God Himself has done that. That's always the way it goes. No one comes apart from that. We have learned to trust. And we are trusting today. But the point now by way of this word is to keep doing that. Every day, learn to say to the Lord, help me trust you. I come to you. I seek refuge in you. Let me be safe and secure in you. And whenever trouble comes, and more trouble, and great trouble, and whatever trouble, Lord, I will trust you. Help me trust you. It's how to live. If you've not started to do that, you need to. 
today, like right now. Right now the Lord calls you. Here in His house and under His Word, He meets with you. And He's saying to us, don't you see what a day of trouble it is? For all kinds of reasons, but most of all your sinful state. This is a day of trouble, great trouble. But there is a stronghold very near and so close and wide open. Yes, truly so. If you go to it, if you go to Him, He will take you in. You will not be safe anywhere else. You will never be safe apart from Him. Or maybe someone says, but I'm, I'm the cause of all my trouble, you know. I did this or I did that. It's all my fault. I did it. I'm the cause. But we're all the cause of our trouble. It goes back to sin, all of it. And we're all sinners. We're all the cause. It doesn't matter. God will take you. God will shelter you. The stronghold is open. For how long, we don't know. Today it is open. Today run to the stronghold and find safety. And us who are in, stay in. Keep trusting. Keep trusting. Until finally all trouble will pass away. You'll look for it, but you'll never find it. Every enemy will be destroyed. All danger will be history. Yes, that day is coming, isn't it? We live in hope. We live in hope of the day of redemption when Christ returns or else calls us home. All trouble will pass away. But till then, let us trust. For the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And He knows those who trust in Him. And we are safe for sure in the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Word, and we acknowledge that it is a rich Word, for it proclaims You as good and a stronghold in the day of trouble, a God who knows those who trust in You. And Lord, we realize very well that it is a day of trouble, and Your Word reminds us that the trouble is greater than we often understand. The trouble is in view of our sin, most of all, and our guilt, and your judgment that is coming. And who can endure the day of your anger? We know that in history, Nineveh faced it, and Nineveh was destroyed. And how many throughout history have been compelled to stand before you, and they've had no security. Your word is so clear. There is a way to be saved, but we must be saved. There is a stronghold to be found, but we must enter in. We pray, Lord, that you will bless us, that we all may know what it is to enter in, to trust in you, to make our way as fast as we can, as early as we can, to that fort, to that castle that is the living God in Jesus Christ. Lord, we marvel at how you have made all this to be through Jesus himself, experiencing your judgment without there being any stronghold for him. How he was compelled to suffer anguish and torment and hell itself altogether alone and forsaken. And through, Lord, what he did, all who come to you may know they will never be forsaken. What a gospel this is and what a help to us also in view of our own sin and guilt and also in view of all that we meet with in life, all the trouble that we find. When is it not a day of trouble in this broken and cursed world? We pray, Lord, that we may live close to you, that we may may be sheltering always in you. We pray that those who are not yet there, you may draw to yourself and even, Lord, if it must be, drive them into that shelter into that safety. We pray that us who are in may live close and may praise you for what you have given. We pray, Lord, for any who may be in particular trouble this morning, conviction or affliction or whatever it may be. We pray that you would apply your word. Make it real to us, O Lord. Make it live in us and do so for the glory, honor, and praise of your great name. 
Oh, hear our prayer. And bless us now as this service concludes and remember us throughout this whole day. We pray it all for Jesus' sake alone. Amen. Let us conclude with singing Psalter number 87. Jehovah from his throne on high looks down with clear and searching eye on all that dwell below. 87, all three stanzas, and then after the benediction, we'll turn to 126, stanza 1 and 5. So 87, and then 126, 1 and 5. Receive now the blessing of the Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.